Starting us off is uh, Dave Everest from Animal Plant and Health Agency. Um, he's been working at the organisation in its various guises since leaving school in 1978, apparently. I think you've given a bit too much away there, Dave. <laughs> too much information. Um, he currently leads the Diagnostic Field Sample Programme under the GB Wildlife Disease Surveillance Partnership. And um, he has a particular interest in wildlife and zoological disease diagnosis, especially red squirrels. Um, he has undertaken the vast majority of the viral diagnosis for the UK and Ireland, and um, he has analysed the hundreds of grey squirrel samples we've sent him through the RSU project from all of the areas, um, specifically looking at pox and adenovirus, and that's what he's going to be talking to us about now and um, sharing some of those results with us. Okay, so as we're sort of celebrating red squirrels, I thought I'd get into the mood. Um, <laughs> right. It gets better. It gets better. Uh, the names on the front are the, the sort of project team that we set together, and I'll give a special mention to Charlene because she's spent a lot of time doing most of the work. Um, so it's, it's down to her and the others for doing all the uh, disease analysis. But it was a very profitable exercise. And hopefully, with the results that you've got, you will feel vindicated and all that you've done. Firstly, for those who weren't here last year, who may not be familiar with it, this is what squirrel pox virus looks like on the, on the right. And those two viral particles are the very first case of squirrel pox from a red squirrel diagnosed in 1980 from Norfolk. Uh, and you see the one on the left has got very sort of small lesions, but that's the sort of picture that you'll be looking at. Adenovirus, there aren't any visible lesions to be seen, apart from a bit of diarrhoea that could, could not be there. But that's the virus, that's what it looks like, and it causes enteric problems. So that encompasses what we were asked to look for and these two case maps are up to the sort of middle or the middle of 19, uh, 2019 and all of those red ones are field case wild born red squirrels pox on the left adeno on the right and the blue ones are captive so we're getting them in both environments but it's just giving you an idea of where these diseases are and where they've been detected so gray squirrel the problem, it's an asymptomatic carrier of both diseases. There are no visible signs of the exterior disease, no lesions on pathology, outwardly healthy, non-infected. You're dealing with a bit of a mystery, but they carry both viruses. So the concept was that we'd be looking at 200 animals a year from each area, and we'd be looking at two samples, a spleen for an adenovirus, a lip for squirrel poxes, because that's the sort of tissue where it uh, accumulates most. And that equated to about 2,400 animals, 4,800 PCRs. But we developed a non-invasive platform where we could look at hair and whiskers. And the project felt that it would be applicable to change the, the format slightly to incorporate hair so you're getting a different tissue matrix to see what was in there, which is a useful uh, exercise, and it, it builds on the data that we'd already got. So we did that, but in doing so, it changed the amount of samples that we could look at. So it was then changed to 300, sample, or 300 animals per area, equating to 1,200 animals, two samples for each, so it was a combined spleen and lip for the tissue and the hair or the whisker uh, and that equated to 2,400 samples, 4,800 PCR. So we got there in the end but it was a slightly different concept and that was the target. That's what actually uh, we received. So there is a disparity in regions. So some didn't get the number, some almost got to the number and thankfully some got well over the number which uh, accounted for the, the, the shortfalls in the other areas. 
So there were 1,200 was the total that was envisaged, 1,500 just over was what we received. Plenty to work with. However, some of them didn't have material from what was listed that had been sent in. Some were duplicate samples. Some of the ink had rubbed off the vials so we couldn't tell what they were. And some that had labels on the vials had fallen off in the post where they'd been under ice packs and we couldn't decipher what they were either. So it was an element that we couldn't use. So we had to change the numbers. So where we were short, we bulked up on some of the others from Wales and Ulster to bring it up to the number, and then we tried to match where we could hair and tissue samples for continuation purposes. So this is what we looked at, and you'll see the number of animals received and sampled, and the numbers of tissues from each area and the numbers of hair for each area. And when you add it all up, it comes to 2,409. So we got there in the end. Uh, and this is why that we're short of hair, because a lot of people, when it was changed, hadn't collected hair. So again, we've used the remaining samples, especially from whales, uh, to, to add to the numbers to get to that figure. And to give you an idea, it's, it's not a quick thing to do for these. The, animal, the samples turn up. They didn't all turn up at the same time, but they turned them up. We put them in the database, and then we've got to get through it. And as you can see there, it's 13 weeks of people's time solid to extract these samples. And that's the basic samples. You've got to then get the samples booked in. You've got to know what you're dealing with. You've got to find the right samples. You've got to weigh the samples out. You've got to put them in, you've got to extract them. That's the first stage. Then you're going to be doing the DNA capture because we had such a large number of samples. So we could do it on a robot uh, with magnetic bead um, kits and it gave us a set number of plates which made it much easier to work with, providing the material that a future date, if we want it for more analyses of different viruses, providing their DNA viruses, we've got that material there. So it's all added value for the future. And that took two weeks, roughly, to do the robot. And then six weeks to do the PCR. So there's 138 assays continuing over a period of six weeks. But for, for August, we couldn't actually use the machine because it was booked out to somebody else. So we've had to sort of stand in a queue. So you're doing other things for the, the analyses while we're waiting. But we got there, results evaluation. And at the end of the day, we made it just after Christmas. And as an example, the paper I've highlighted there is the one that we used for developing the assays and it's published if you're interested. Uh, look at that reference and it'll give you some idea of what we're doing. So what did we find? Plenty. Uh, there's the number of samples and the number of percentage of positive tissues by area. So you've got 20, just over 20% from Northern England in the tissues for adenovirus, and a disproportionate large amount of squirrel pox, which was a bit of a surprise um, from, from Northern England. We wouldn't normally expect to find that amount in there. Uh, and for the other reasons, that was a reasonable amount as well, because you get it at low level in the tissue squirrel pox. So if you've got a decent enough test, you can detect it. And with our test, we can, we can detect it. But adenovirus, as you'll see there, you've got 48, 46, 43%, all much of a muchness, but a pretty reasonable amount. And we're talking nearly 600 samples, nearly 40-odd percent of those tested had adenovirus, and 10%, which is a good number for squirrel pox. And within that, there's 5% of those animals had both viruses. And that, that's an interesting uh, thing to, to be looking at as well, because it does happen. And that detected it. And then we looked at hair. Uh, and we didn't find any at all in, in the ones from Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, Northern England, which was a bit surprising. I was expecting to find some. Um, but again, we found a reasonable percentage of squirrel pox. Uh, and there wasn't many in hair. And, and this was a real surprise because we've done previous studies in Wales where we were finding 90% of the, the hair samples were positive, and we found whiskers of much the same number. So it was a bit of a surprise not to find a larger volume, but we have come across it where you start 
controlling greys over a number of years over the same ground and the incidence of positives has been shown to, to drop. So that may be accounting for some of these, but some of it was a bit of an unknown area. But again, you've, you've just got a few animals that have got uh, both viruses. So when we're looking at the combined percentage, you've got it there, 14, 30, 30, 20. You've got 29%, nearly 30% have got adenovirus from the samples overall. And you've got 10% of squirrel pox. So it's a good number of... That is the top end of what you'd usually detect with squirrel pox in, in the animals because it's a low-level infection that you detect. And there were still a good few there that had both viruses. So when you're looking at an overall percentage of positive samples, you've got 43% of them in the tissue have got adenovirus, you've got 11% of adenovirus in the hair, equating to nearly 30% of all samples having adenovirus, and we've got still this 10% of squirrel pox, and a few that have got both. So 953 out of 1,400 odd samples, which is 2,400 analysed, and it's 40% of all those samples positive for adenovirus, or squirrel pox. So all that work you've done, you can be vindicated that there are results to be obtained uh, from, from all your areas uh, and across a range of, of samples. When you look at the percentage of positive animals, then you look at the bottom column, 70% of all the animals tested uh, that were positive 70% of them have got adenovirus, 536. You've got another 15% that just have squirrel pox, 111. But you've got another 15%, 115 of them, that have got both viruses. So when you actually add it all up, you've got 85% of all the positive animals have got adenovirus in them, either as a dual... Uh, infection or a single adenovirus infection and when you're looking at squirrel pox you've got 30% of the positive animals have got squirrel pox in them um, so it's, it's a large large number it's over half 54% of all the animals that were tested that were positive for those viruses 54% which is a considerable number um, but it covers the whole of the regions, and they're all pretty much similar, but you've got far, far more adenovirus present um, than you have squirrel pox. And, and you remember, it's all an asymptomatic infection. These animals have got no signs of disease. They're healthy. They just carry it normally, but you wouldn't know it unless you were uh, looking for it, and you're taking that out of the population, but there's still an awful lot out there probably in the same sort of figures in your areas that you will be looking for. So when we did the assays, we've, uh, I've got a graph there, and it shows the, the CT. So the positive control we put on gives us an indication of the levels uh, that we'll be looking at in the samples for a good positive, and we're using that as a baseline. And you can see that the last assays have dropped off but they're well within the parameters for the three standard deviations of the mean. So every assay on there is a viable assay. And we're looking at, for adenovirus, we're talking about 21% plus or minus 4%. So it's, it's a, quite a tight profile. So across the whole of those 138 PCRs that we did, that's the sort of graph that we're getting. So we were quite pleased because this is a large number of assays, a big program, and we're content that what we were seeing... Uh, was, was constant across. So in a summary, we've got a landscape programme of four separate UK areas, 1,500-odd animals submitted, 1,400 that were sampled, 2,409 samples were analysed, 51% of the tissues, 24% of the hair were positive for one or two viruses, 40% 
overall of the samples tested were positive, but 54% of all the animals were positive. 54%. So that's a number, a large number, that you can be happy that the project detected what it is set out to do. And just some acknowledgements. Thank you to Red Squirrels for selecting us to do the analyses. It's much appreciated. It gave us a big opportunity to actually do a lot more work with our new hair program that we did, so we backed up exactly what we found in the previous smaller assays. And thanks to all the partners for <laughs> supplying the samples. But I also want to thank, I know he's not there anymore, but I want to thank Simon for over 10 years he's provided us with maps from all the data that we've generated that have gone into various publications, meetings uh, like this that he's provided. So the, the two that I showed earlier, he provided for us. So it's a thanks to Simon that he's done all that. And he did say that Bonnie would actually help me out in the future. <laughs> he did mention that, so that's fine. <laughs> um, and thank you to the EU Life and National Lottery Heritage Funding for actually providing the funding us to do it. But it's not all bad, OK? You do get the odd occasion when you find a diagnosis in the grey squirrel. And the squirrel pox particles on the bottom is the only grey squirrel ever found with pathological squirrel pox virus disease. And that's from 1994 from near Alice Holt, down in sunny old Surrey here. Uh, the one in the top left corner, the paramyxovirus, we found in a number of grey squirrels uh, in cell lines that we were looking at. But again, they reckon it was only a non-pathogenic, asymptomatic infection. And we found some in reds as well. But again, it's non-pathogenic, so it's just something they carry. And the one in the background was an enterovirus one, which is a real rarity. And we're writing that up at the moment to submit it for a publication. Uh, and that's the only time that's that ever been found in the grey squirrel uh, as well. So just to finish, thank you for listening. I will take questions, but never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking about. Thank you. <laughs>